the book opens and you can it's created its own little universe and you see behind the pop-ups and you experiment and you find things and children enjoy в эфире поиск медиа то что скрыто за повесткой дня это весной издательство А плюс А совместно с проектом Теймсон Хадсон запускает новую книжную серию «Основы искусства». И сегодня у нас в гостях Роджер Торп, создатель этой серии. Nice to meet you here in our studio. Very good. So, how did you start the publishing the books of art, and for how long actually now do you work in this industry, in this sphere? I'm a publisher, um, and so I've been been publishing all my all my career. Um, but I started off in, in different from publishing houses and I uh, for quite a while I was at a, an, an academic publishing house called Routledge where I was publishing a lot of philosophy and cultural thinking. One thing which I was conscious of when I was doing those philosophy books was going to the book fairs and seeing uh, such amazing publishing happening in other parts of the world uh, for children and they're doing incredible illustrated books and um, uh, really exciting graphic design uh, and so I got excited about that and therefore set up a publishing program for children. And, and, and so I was there 12 years doing all of that. Uh, what kind of uh, literature for children actually do you publish? What is what do you think is interesting now for children? So when I was at, at Tate, I um, actually I, I ran the editorial team and I hired somebody doing digital publishing, and we were doing digital. Oh, you were doing yeah. Uh, uh, I set up. We set some interesting digital publishing mm -hmm. around children's. Um, books and so I'd made some great books and then we thought we could digital an app from those which were interesting to make and they were um, uh, experimental but in fact the, it comes back in terms of what parents like to read with their children and what children actually enjoy is actually a book and there's a physical um, characteristics of a book which is quite unique and it can be enjoyed and what I find interesting in making books for children is actually thinking about how that works as a system so sometimes you might break it up you might have pop-ups or you might have cutouts you might shape, change the shape of the book it might become something different and all that sort of experimenting around the book is something which happened um, early on in the 20s in Russia and it happened in, in Poland, it happened in France in the 30s and, and, I'm, and in the 60s and there's some great Czech examples but right now I'm doing quite a lot with a lot of, um, for instance, um, there's a wonderful French uh, paper engineer, Gérard Le Monaco. I made a uh, pop-up book of boats with him, which is really uh, amazingly complex, but com is just very beautiful. And then also uh, his, his, his students uh, include a couple who made a book, which I did um, with the French house, Elium, um, called uh, in, the, in the Forest and Under the Ocean. And then I've done a, a Thames and Hudson. I've done one with them called That's My Hat, where the book opens and you can it's created its own little universe and you see behind the pop-ups and you experiment and you find things and Not children project, enjoy, yeah. <laughs> enjoy that kind of thing as much and, and it's, it's a printed book but it does it's doing all these exciting things and then then it can just simply be just stunning illustration but somebody like um, Dick Bruner who did uh, is in, in the UK it's Miffy in France in Holland Nintia is most famous for yeah. uh, a bunny rabbit um, but he did these he, he, he decided the books should be this size because that's the size of a child's hands yeah. and, and, and he made all his books that size and he showed those particular colours he had to use which were influenced by Leger and Matisse and he carried that on um, you know he just saw that and, and that's what I find very interesting it's their artists creating books the, yeah. the customer happens to be a child or the parent of the child um, and, and it's, they work in the same way so I see the visual world, uh, in terms of pu visual publishing, we are quite unusual, but it was the same at Tate, where I, I oversee something which is um, an art list, which includes children's, because it's the visual that really has, has a hold. And they can be instructional books, they can be books about art, or yeah. history of art, or you know, non-fiction. What books of art um, are needed by a wide uh, range of uh, readers how to tell people about art. Um, there are some classic books which have really stood the test of time. Gombrich's Story of Art and John Burge's Ways of Seeing. But for this series I had the a very much the strong um, response from the people who uh, sell the books in the bookshops and in the museums and galleries. Um, they were saying uh, there's a need for an introductory series like this which is well illustrated. It's a beautiful book. The design is thought through. Um, and it, it instructs and it's something you can 
learn something from but you don't feel intimidated. I think the key word is intimidated. People are intimidated by art, um, by modern art. So we're doing, these are very broad range books and so the f future ones include um, uh, when we're doing uh, key moments in art history or um, we're doing women artists uh, and we're doing pop art and we're doing surrealism and it'll go on with more. But the good thing is it gives the opportunity in each context to uh, make sure the balance is right because art history has historically been very Western, yeah. very white, very male, and, and so... We don't male, yeah. Uh, yeah, I so now so. is an opportunity when you're correcting the... when you're presenting to a completely fresh audience that it isn't, art, art isn't like that. It's, it's a diverse range across the world, international, different uh, in all respects, and to put it... To, to be able to kind of get that on the right. What kind of books uh, of, uh, about art is needed by uh, people? Uh, is it different uh, types of books in Ru for Russia and for, for, for Great Britain, for USA, because of different cultural situations and a lot of uh, factors? Yes, it's a challenge and it's a very interesting one because I, I need to build the series in partnership. Yeah. So um, we, we're talking, I mean, we, we talk with all our co-publishers and we want to be sure that they're happy with the next project and what we're taking forward. And I also want to hear what they want to have. Now there'll be some in our forward programme which might not be appropriate for their for their readers or there may be others that they really want to have done which we need to to put into the list so yeah ah, so you uh, when you was working on the Syria you were discussing uh, the themes with the Chinese uh, and Russian partners or not we have well I, what I what I, to start it off with I had very good discussions with that we have a very good uh, rights team yeah. we have a team of people who deal with different language publishers and so I was asking their advice on you know where we go and how we build it up and the, the sort of initial list how it should look um, so they had some very good ideas and they talk to some of their and the publishers that they work with closely to get a, a feeling that this would could oh, work yeah. for them so what is it? and then we followed that up at the book fair and uh, to make sure yes have we done it the right way this is how we're presenting it you know do you feel this matches what you thought would work for you um, but I, I, I'm very interested for instance to hear in, in, in the Russian context what it is that might be right and necessary to do. Uh, I think there is also the big difference uh, between uh, books uh, market in uh, USA and in Russia. Yeah, it's a tough one and certain in certain languages um, yeah. other than, I mean, smaller languages than Russian, um, you know, they would not be able to do very many copies um, in, it would still be a large run for their, for their however many million people in their market it would be uh, necessary to do a smaller run and so we work with that um, um, and just try and make it possible and the, the best way is if we have a number of other publishers so the, those publishers for instance the Chinese well they might do under license but other publishers who we would join up with makes the run big enough so that we can cope with somebody having a shorter quantity uh, the key question part of the series point of the series is it's affordable so we want to make it affordable and it's cheaper than uh, other books you know so, so if you feel you want to get it you can have an impulse where you say oh yes it's not too expensive I can you know this will I'll get something out of this or somebody else will get this out of this um, and and so the price is very crucial and yet the cost of reproducing all those images mm -hmm. and printing them all in color and making it all <laughs> is very high so you got to that's why you have this the, the partnership to make it possible because unless you did work with lots yeah. together uh, it's the same actually in children's books very often because they have the same issue you've got to get a very low retail price yeah. uh, and you can't do that unless you print a, a decent quantity and so those amazing pop-up books I mean for those they're so complex and the you know the cost is, is phenomenal you've got to make a huge run and so you've got to get lots of people together so there's a lot of faith those publishers you know you've got to you know believe in the project um, and, and really want it to happen to make it happen. I think it's uh, it's a ch and in terms of who's going to read a book that's such a tricky one and you have to have I mean we obviously you know as a publishing company that's what our business is so we have endless discussions. And it's interesting how it works now because we have been talking that the uh, children are changing with the time. What uh, what is the destiny of books in the digital uh, era? I don't, I don't know. I, it's hard to say, but in the UK, uh, 
I'm, I'm quite pleased that vinyl, I don't know if it's the same here, but vinyl has had a big comeback in music. Oh, yeah. yeah so yeah. everybody's going, so the, the proportion of sales of CDs, uh, you know, they've disappeared. But the, and obviously, there's online you can get what you want, but people actually do like to have a physical object. And um, uh, so there's that on one side. And, and on the other side is the uh, fact that actually it's never gone away. And in terms of the kind of books we're doing, but it's interesting to see Amazon and, and the others and the um, Nook, the Barnes & Noble one, the, the Kindle, they're old hat now because you've got your new media where you can put all whatever you want on. Yeah, but, uh, that um, is what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the books which transferred easily to digital were the, non -fic were the fiction, were the mass market fiction, and that really did suffer. Um, but in terms of illustrated books, um, which are working with, with, with pictures and, and they only work with pictures, um, the book still uh, has carried through. And it, it's had two periods where the, the law was that it was the end of the book. There was the CD-ROMs, which were a few, a few years back, and um, that was, I remember, they said, that's all, you know, there won't be any books, and this was in the 1980s or something. And then now, it's, and then with the digital devices, clearly um, how you communicate has changed entirely, um, yeah. but the books still kind of, uh, they hang on in there. And I, d I don't think it's a relic, it's actually, I mean, in terms of us publishing, uh, we'll, you know, obviously have to be very commercially minded that there are the number of people who will buy a physical book for us to be able to print it. And, um, and in fact, in the UK, the sales for those printed books have risen, the illustrated books, uh, over the last few years. So it's stable. Uh, oh. They've actually gone up, and for children and for the art books. Um, art books largely sustained by exhibitions, but the children's just anyway. And people still want to give, uh, that's another thing to bear in mind, that giving a book is a gift. It's a different thing giving a physical book than sending a link. You've got the material there, but they still want the physical book where they can refer back, reference. It, it is just more easy um, as, a, as a project. And also, the repro colour reproduction on the screen yeah, yeah. is, I mean, the, we go through to make, as all publishers doing art books do, go through so many proofs to make sure the colour matches. I remember going through with, um, uh, before we, uh, at Tate, it was uh, Henri Matisse exhibition of um, the cutouts, and Georges Matisse, who looks after the estate, came for every reprint of that book to check the colour the color against the work on the wall uh, <laughs> to make sure it matched, which was great because they, you know, he's passionate to make sure that Henri Matisse's work is cor correctly produced, um, and it means, but it also means that the person buying the book knows that. This is this is the work, you know. Whereas when you're looking it up on screen, it could be anything. <laughs> so, so yeah. Don't you see it will be some kind of collaboration? You will publish the book and also some kind of additional content, the media content, and etc. And that's already happening. And so, in, in fact, we do, um, some, as I mentioned, some textbooks, particularly for the American college market, and we have uh, videos and uh, a lot of material online, which could, when once you're a student and you're using that book, you can refer to and this material and and um, it's also possible to connect that with what's happening to some of the major museums so Met and the Metropolitan Museum in New York and MoMA in New York are both um, um, developing a system so that you can work with the material and you can have video instruction and uh, alongside so they they as you said they can work uh, complementary. Just advice what do you advise our readers our auditory to read. I'm, I'm never prescriptive because I think there's so much wonderful stuff out there. Yeah, I, of course, I, it's, diff it's I, difficult. I, I tend to say, uh, have a look on the shelves. If you've got a good bookshop, have a have a browse and find what, what works for you. Sometimes it's uh, the literature, you know, shelves as much as the art shelves, uh, which kind of stir the imagination. And it's interesting being, working with artists and the books that they, they recommend. Um, uh, it can really spur, spur things. So uh, with Miroslav Balka, um, he was very inspired by Paul Chalan. Uh, you know, and I think Paul Chalan's really important. But, uh, he also we did the book based uh, around, the, which I did with him, was based around a book by Beckett. And Samuel Beckett is yeah. somebody who you can't really go far wrong with. And, uh, um, and and so there's all sorts of different approaches. But um, I would also, you know, just encourage openness to finding out new things that you haven't seen before um, rather than 
having to be told what, what it is you should, you should read. Um, it's think one thing leads to another, I, I find. And if you're inspired by, for instance, something on a, a particular topic, or if it's a, a particular artist, then you then look on the shelves, find what else is going on, and, and move, move on to that. And if, it, if, it's, if it's possible to do it yourself, as opposed to being guided from a Amazon recommend, then it's kind of it's more fun, and also if you kind of bump into something you never expected to, that's what I yeah. Find but to... Russia, we are still translating uh, old French philosophers. For example, Ed Marginim is publishing the books of Althusser, Adorno, okay, yeah. Arendt, uh, and so now we are yeah. really happy that we have yeah. been published uh, the book of Agamben from okay, 1970, Agamben, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, man yeah, without yeah, yeah. content. Yeah, so we are yeah. just trying to run. And yes. just, I don't think that in France people now are reading uh, Sartre or... Uh, to both, to both, uh, they are, I think that's so. I think so. I think they carry on. I, mean, I think there is. Uh, it is interesting. Those are yeah. They're all good um, uh, people. There's also um, you know Tolstoy is amazing and Dostoevsky is amazing. So and there's and the stories, short stories. Um, so there's there's stuff which um, it's hard because I, I, I love so many, so many kind of books uh, to then settle on one or, or two and, and without um, uh, Joyce. You know where would we be? You know James. So there's so much. Um, joy and uh, entertainment to be had from from books. So I just want to encourage people to find what tactics their fancy and then then discover more. <laughs> Thank you, Roger, for the conversation. It was really nice to talk, and we know more now about uh, publishing in uh, Europe. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you.